So how do we change this? Knowledge of how this works is the first step for facilitating change. Because the link happens so quickly, it is actually a rare case when those involved know to stop, pause, and give themselves some space to see what is essentially going on in a present time situation. Instead, we jump into old ideas, old opinions, old comparisons to previous experience or other such judgments and opinions. They seem to just flood in when they start opening the door in this library, one type of book, oh, you want that type of book and it's like the librarian goes back and gets a whole big pile of the same kind of books and comes in. They then seem to flood in, and this is why reaction happens so often, how it happens. The person gets consumed in what is unessential, feeling the pushing action of clinging, and they run right into habitual tendency as it arises. This is interesting. I can see this. Could you, could, could this be how anger situations work between people too? Yes, on a smaller or larger scale, this can make the difference between war and peace. So I'll let you let me give you a situation where having this knowledge made a difference. Now, I taught you already the example of the woman who works in the office dealing with the with the boss who doesn't explain why, but he's so angry every Monday morning. But let's change it a little bit and take a hopeless woman who does not understand her depression, and I'll ex just explain it to you. When we were on the East Coast um, of the United States and I was driving for Bonte for two years, uh, we were traveling around to look at all the different temples and what was going on in the United States in various parts. And when that was going on, um, we were going down 95 north-south interstate highway from the north to the south that runs on the eastern east coast, eastern seaboard. And as we're traveling down, they used to have trouble uh, with fires. Many times they would have trouble with fires and there would be so much smoke that was blowing towards the ocean that, that you would have to stop and you would have to drive off the highway if they blocked it because of lack of vision they would block the highway and we had to go and we had to go to a motel and, and, and check in with two rooms. And then I was gonna check the internet, but the internet was down because of this, a lot of stuff was happening. And what happened was there was a woman who was in the office. She and her husband owned this small motel and she was an Indian woman from India and her husband, checked us in and he said, you know, if you have any trouble with the internet, just come up and ask my wife, she'll be in the office. So he was leaving for a couple hours and I went to the room to check the internet and of course it was down and I went to the office and she was there. And then and she said, oh, you're here. And I said, yes, I wanna know about the internet. And she said, well, can I help you? We can check inside, come inside. Let's see if it works better inside with the modem I have instead of out here with the motel modem. We went inside, but it didn't work either. And I noticed she was really sad and she offered me some seven up um, to drink. And, you know, um, we got to talking and uh, I said, you're upset. And she said, I have a lot of depression and I don't know how it works. And, you know, I was just learning about the 12 links of dependent origination. This is before the charts were built. After this incident, I went back to the center. When I got back, I created the 12 link chart and Bonte helped me to make sure it was right. But at that time I was just learning them. And, and I listened to her explain that her husband was going to leave and they had only one son. He wanted to take the boy with him. He didn't think she was capable of taking care of him by herself and she was brokenhearted. And um, it was a pretty bad situation. And I sat there listening to her and then I said something to her because I wanted to see what would happen. I, I asked her, what, how would you feel if I could show you how this depression 
is not yours. And she just sat there and looked at me at first. And then she said, I would feel a whole lot better, you know, because um, what's happening for her is she would, her example was this, this is what she described to me when I'm alone or in the evening, if he's working all day and I finish my work and I come in here, I'll sit here and I'll crochet. I'll crochet is like knitting. And then he'll come in the room, her husband and son, and sit and watch the TV quietly. And, um, but what happens for me is quite terrible because what happens is that I suddenly get a thought in my mind and it's dark, a dark thought. And I feel the negativity of this thought. And what happens is I, I know what's going to happen. I project what, I, she doesn't say it this way, but she projected what was going to happen. She said, because I know what happens next. I stopped knitting. I put it in the, ba in the basket. I take it with me, turn out the lights. If the lights are on and they shouldn't be, I go in the bedroom and uh, put my knitting aside and turn the light off, go to bed and cry until I can go to sleep. And I cannot, I cannot do this anymore. The medicine was not stabilizing her enough to, to quench this, this, what was happening, but she was totally lost in the weight of believing this was happening to her. This is the first part. It was happening to her is what she believed. And it was her depression, personally her depression. And then therefore it was her fault. And the difficulty with her husband and child and the whole situation, she was to blame no one else. And you see how this compounds, how depression doesn't, depression is a very um, hard situation to deal with because you start with a depressive disorder as a diagnosis, but it's only the beginning because what happens is a compounding diagnosis, a secondary and tertiary, um, and even a fourth diagnosis that happens. And it kind of runs like this. You start with tension about something, and then it goes into stress, and they give you a stress disorder. And then they say, when you can't manage that, that this is a depression. And then when they say it's a depression, you think this is a big thing that I shouldn't have this, and it's my fault. That's where it starts. When you start blaming yourself, uh, then the sub-diagnosis has to do with withdrawal and withdrawing away from people the way she did and not being able to counter it because it only feels like a weight, something in your mind that you have no account, no account for and, and you don't understand, but you have no power over handling this at all. That's the worst part of it. And it pushes other people away. So then you blame yourself for their sadness is my fault also. So you have five things now that you are saying is your fault, you see, and you're diving into I'm a victim and this is my fault and there's no way out. The other thing that happens to a person when there's not support groups in the area to help is that they grab onto the idea that this is me, it's mine, and I'm to blame. And then they say, and I'm the only one this happens to in the world. They don't see the vastness of the depression damage worldwide. They don't know to look around further because they're so hurt and trying to let go of the suede. So what's happening to her? And then we explain to her how contact happens with the sense doors and with the contact as condition. In her case, it was a thought, just a thought that popped up and she didn't ask for it. She was sitting there knitting. And then a feeling arises felt as painful, pleasant or neutral. And this was a painful feeling for her. And when the feeling uh, as condition craving arises with a tighter tension in the mind, a tight, it's tightening slowly and then then what happens is she doesn't like it. I don't like it, mine comes in. And this is not yet an emotional reaction. This craving held inside her the desire to change this whole thing. And what was going on with her depression 
whenever she thought about the situation, the tension would just grow and tighten and she it would roll over like a spinning wheel inside and press down on her and tighten both mind and body. And her discontentment grew and her whole, her whole situation got worse, but um, she had no information. And so she couldn't help herself, but this is what we were trying, I was trying to teach her. And the craving is as conditioned, the clinging arises and then it runs stories. And what happens to her when she's sitting on the couch is, and this has happened before. And then I, if I, if they see me getting like this, they'll get upset. So I should leave the room and take care of them. The responsibility, the mother and the child gets involved too. And the stories run in the mind about why she dislikes everything is because this is tumbling down and she becomes frustrated and and she um, keeps trying to figure out what to do. The next thing she has to learn is about habitual emotional tendencies that arise. And this is the place where we can get caught repeating the unwholesome reactions without looking more clearly about what exactly is happening with this emotional situation. So the feelings turn into emotions, emotions turn into tears, tears turn into withdrawal, uh, withdrawal turns into panic attacks, let's stay away from people at all expense, like we drive down the road and he might say, could you run in the store and get something for me? And she frets and starts crying and can't go in the store because she can't be around people. This is what was happening to her also. So this is where many of us are stuck, always behaving um, in this same uncreative type of response. But what the Buddha demonstrates is how a person unconsciously pulls out of a familiar reaction and plays it out as a heated emotion within an event too. It turns into anger at herself. It turns into anger at the people around her and it's all misdirected and it's all coming from something inside that was similar before too. So the habitual tendency link is where these emotional reactions compound and they begin to push to get out of us and they can be upsetting very upsetting for the mind. They can cause a fever, cause exhaustion, cause sleep disorders. This habitual tendency is from the past events that they live in your brain in, a, in this personal little library and collect there and they're based on your previous exposure strictly and experiences from before. And this is where the heated reactions will lie hidden and they can turn into reactive behavior too. And this can happen with a high level depressive disorder that you push and push and push to go to the hospital or you push them and push them to do something and they haven't taken uh, the stabilizing medication, they can just explode. And this is, they feel trapped, just trapped like an animal. This library offers us wholesome responses to in truth and our interactions are no longer just happening in the here and now, the behavior is influenced by the past reactions unconsciously pulled up and repeated again and again. The heart of the matter is that it cancels out the possibility for new innovative thinking, unless you understand this knowledge of how it, it's there and it isn't something that we, we can't uh, just close the door. If you understand hypothetically it's there, then you can play the game of I'm going to close the door and put on the lock and not live through reactions anymore. And this is where they're coming from. And if you don't believe that's where they're coming from, you need to try to um, look at taking a small, a small journal and keeping it for a week or two to record what's happening in your situations and then look at it and see the cycle, pick out the cycle, and then you counter it. You counter it by laughing and you counter it by this is here and it's arising, but whatever arises passes away. So you use Anicca as part of your, your defense because Anicca can make you understand that this isn't going to last. This is something arising and it's there and it goes away. Each time it comes like this, 
goes like that, goes away. When you have one of those, what can you do? You let it be. You go in the opposite direction, let it run underneath, but replace it with a wholesome. So you're letting go, relaxing, you're smiling and coming back to sending loving kindness into yourself and to the situation. Identifying the link is the first step. And then once you do that, um, you then have a chance to change. And so what did you change? What did you change? You changed your mind. You changed your mind by understanding you have the power of setting up intention to go in the opposite director and countering this, embracing the contradiction to this depression. So what good is that going to do? It is going to do retrain. What it does is it retrains your brain. So why do we know this? Because in the research, this is simple, really. Go online and look up how do I change a habit if I'm over 25? That's the one to look at. How can I change a habit if I am over 25? You should be able to find some research on that about neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the flexibility of the channels in your brain, the behavior channels, behavior avenues that are set up in your brain. And these neural pathways, one was there for fear, one was there for worry, one was there for anger, one was there for distress. And if you understand those you have the power of contradiction with those. So how do you do this? How do you, how do you handle a, a little notebook? You first, um, at the end of each day, you spend a little time on the log, what happened to you that was negative in the past 24 hours. You write down what you personally remember about any interaction that brought up lingering concern, or it brought up distress, or it brought up sadness. These are instances where you felt the heat of the body and mind rise up, or you acted out after some disagreement about something at work or at home. So to review your day, you ask yourself some questions. Did, did I have any emotions come up while dealing with other people during my day uh, or dealing with my own self? while driving home when something difficult or challenging had happened earlier in the day? Am I carrying something home that I'm not driving? <laughs> I love the one about you're, you're on your way home in the car and you get on the LA uh, freeway and you're not driving. You're thinking about this, <laughs> it's not a good idea. This is where all the accidents come from being on the cell phone or thinking about something other than driving. And it's hard to drive on the LA freeway because there's so much traffic. You wanna to try to make sure it's just like Washington DC. If you live there, you will find out what time of day to get on or not get on the freeway and just stay away from it and don't go in it when it's our, you know, shoulder to shoulder cars across six lanes on a road. <laughs> that's crazy. So yes, that's a 12 lane highway. The loops around the cities in the United States have six lanes going this way and six lanes going that way. And they circulate these large cities like um, you know, Washington DC, Philadelphia, Baltimore, um, you know, and all the major cities are set up the same way. So now that you have been alerted to the existence of this habitual emotional tendency link, Write down what you saw happening inside your mind more than one time and see if you can identify the cause of it. And then let me know what you find when you review the log. Bring it in, you know, ask a question about it. This happened, what, what, what am I supposed to do or whatever. But you keep the log for one or two weeks time and then you report back and evaluate it to yourself or to another friend who's doing the same kind of work. And when you do this, you try to use the four-step investigation uh, that the Buddha presented within the Four Noble Truths. And this is a really good way of helping yourself. What is this that keeps repeating, you say to yourself? What is it? And you figure that out and write it down. Then you say to yourself, 
What is the cause of this still coming up? What set off my fear? What set off my anger? Does this resemble something that's from my past specifically? If it's specifically in this life, it makes it easier. But if it's you can't see it because it's from another life and it's trickling down, like me being afraid of heights, it's a little bit different kind of work you have to do. Now pin it down. What did it resemble from some time before? What was it? And then the third question is, what would the cessation of this look like instead of what happened? Did I take something personal in that event? Is that what I did? I let go of an impersonal perspective. Did I take something personally? What could I change to stop this from happening again? That's the question you ask. And the fourth one is, what could you change to help yourself get rid of this kind of reaction? And you can look at the pieces of the Eightfold Path. And when you look at those pieces in the Eightfold Path, when you're doing this experiment, okay, you're saying to yourself, basically, did I give up my anatta perspective? Did I give up looking at, did it slip away, this impersonal idea? Did I get, where was the personal part? That's what you're really looking for. Because the real, the real one that is really <laughs> there, uh, he left it for us to find. And I can understand why he did it this way, the Buddha, to get you to go through the knowledge you needed to know to really understand Atta and Anatta. So he says, craving is the cause of suffering. But then over time, of course, people who are meditating a lot and are advanced will say, well, it's craving and it's ignorance. Well, now see, ignorance, what I do with ignorance is say, yes, we were all ignorant when we started this. But ignorance is just a gray one on the chart because we let go of that because now we're gaining knowledge all the time. And every time we, we do a lesson like this or we go and practice or we set up a journal and we really start to work, we are obliterating this thing about ignorance. We are not ignoring this. We're embracing it to try to figure out how everything works like Siddhartha did. Okay, so that's where ignorance doesn't need to be poo-pooed so much because ignorance just meant you didn't know anything yet. And now you're learning the knowledge through vision, through direct knowledge. That's why I give you the exercises. Don't believe me. Don't come to me to say this even 10 or 20 times, which I did in this thing, you know, to explain what it is. But see it for yourself through your own examination and testing. That is the most important part, okay? 